Mother accused of killing her son talks about the shooting and why she says she had to do it. That's ahead on Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live at 6. Plus, an unusual Valley School is getting national attention. On Channel 8 on your side, consumer editor Michael Geeser. This is the Neptune, a device that's changing the lives of medical workers. We'll have that story coming up. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the news leader. I don't know what made me do it. I, I just got, I thought he's going to kill me. And I guess my self-preservation kicked in. 71-year-old Mary Lou Gordon shot her son, but in an interview with Channel 8 Eyewitness News, Gordon says she shot him in self-defense. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Polly Gonzalez, in for Paula Francis. And I'm John Gilbert. Gary Waddell is on medical leave. The shooting happened over the weekend, but so far, Gordon has not been arrested. Tonight, the elderly mother tells her side of the story. Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live. Janine Gill is at the crime scene with more. Janine? Mary Lou Gordon is staying with friends right now. She says it's just too painful to come back to this house. She's still dealing with the shock of killing her son. I just did it because I thought he was going to kill me. And at that point, I didn't care what happened. The horrible memories of what happened Saturday morning keep replaying in Mary Lou Gordon's mind. The 71-year-old made the most difficult decision in her life. She aimed a gun at her 39-year-old son, Keith Fletchall, and shot him to death when he came at her with a baseball bat. I miss him terribly. I can't tell you how much I loved him. Gordon says her son was high on drugs Saturday morning when he asked her for money to get the title for his pickup truck. But Gordon refused because she had already given him money the day before and knew it would go to drugs. It had been violent for about an hour and the terrible, terrible things and breaking things. And he said I was putting scorpions in his clothes and as he broke up his furniture trying to get the scorpions. I mean, just he was out of his mind. Gordon says the abuse had been going on for 20 years. Her son kept getting into trouble. She felt sorry for him, but she continued to support him. It's a decision she regrets and wants others to learn from. I've spent thousands on him, thousands. I put a second mortgage on my home. I ran up credit cards. I, I don't know why I kept doing it. All I can say is that it was the wrong thing to do. Gordon lost her oldest son several years ago. He was also a drug addict, and he died of an overdose. Police are recommending to the district attorney's office that they do not file criminal charges against Gordon because they believe she shot her son in self-defense. Janine Gill, Channel 8 Eyewitness News, live. All right, thank you, Janine. Besides that homicide, there were several others this weekend. A woman's body was found yesterday afternoon near Boulder Highway in Flamingo. Investigators say the circumstances surrounding the woman's death are suspicious, but they're not yet ruling it a homicide. And a 15-year-old was killed and another teenager was hurt in what police believe was a gang shooting. Police say the teenagers were shot several times near Rancho and the Las Vegas Zoo. The second victim is in critical condition right now. Also, a 72-year-old man was found dead in a hotel room near Paradise and Desert Inn on Saturday. Police arrested a California man and charged him with the murder. They say he beat the victim to death. Striking cat bus drivers are now without health insurance and they could soon be without jobs. That's after their union couldn't reach an agreement with the company that operates the Valley's public transit system. Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live with Tom Jones at the cat bus terminal near Industrial and Tompkins. Tom? Well, John, these striking bus drivers say they're not concerned about losing their health insurance or the fact that ATC Vancom is preparing to hire more replacement drivers. They say they couldn't accept ATC Vancom's latest proposal because they would have ended up losing in the long run. I would have actually taken a pay cut and still have to pay $120 a year for my insurance if I had ratified that contract. Striking bus driver Bob Stamp says that's why most drivers could not accept ATC Vancom's latest proposal. The proposal called for a 2% increase in pay, but it also included an increase in the amount the drivers had to 
contribute to their health insurance. The drivers say that would have wiped out the pay increase. It is an imaginary wage increase. It does not exist. I don't know of anybody who isn't contributing something towards their health care. ATC spokesperson Valerie Michael says the proposal was a fair one. Now the company is focusing on hiring replacement drivers to get its service back up to 100 percent. We're working on that. We're hiring. We're continuing to bring in our replacement drivers. We have people slowly coming back over the line. The ATC says its bus routes are operating at about 70 to 80 percent, but the striking bus drivers say that's not true. They're at the bus yards like you see here, and they say they've noticed, noticed only about 30 to 40 percent of the buses running. As for negotiations between the two sides, they're non-existent at this point. Tom Jones, Channel 8 Eyewitness News, live. Thanks, Tom. A new survey shows Nevada teachers rank among the best paid, not because of their salaries, but because the low cost of living here in Southern Nevada. The survey by the National Teachers Union compared Nevada teacher salaries to other states. Nevada ranked 12th overall. School officials say one problem is the state doesn't pay enough to first year teachers. That means they can't draw new teachers to the state. Meanwhile, a Clark County school is getting some national recognition. A research firm has ranked the Odyssey Charter School as a model for virtual schools across the country. Channel 8 Eyewitness News anchor Colleen May has the story. This isn't your traditional classroom. They didn't have washing machines back then. Ten-year-old Lydia Gonzalez is studying at home. She's very academically gifted oh, and... Um, that doesn't come out in a, a group setting, unfortunately, in a school environment. Lydia suffered a brain injury when she was born, but the straight-A student isn't letting that hold her back. She's one of hundreds of students enrolled at the Odyssey Charter School. The school allows students kindergarten through eighth grade to study at home with licensed teachers visiting students once a week. The programs are individualized for them, so if they're working at a, a grade level above or a grade level below, they can, they can work at a pace and at a level that's comfortable for them. High school students do the same, but also meet one day a week at the school. I think we're more approachable. I think things are a little more calm here, a little more relaxed. So the students, if they want to focus, if they really do want to uh, get a good grade, I think it's easier for them here. I like it more because it's less crowded and it's easier to get work done. I like how teachers work with you one-on-one. -on -one. It's really good. I learn a lot better this way. A California research firm recently ranked Odyssey as one of seven models for these so-called virtual schools. Many say the key is parent involvement. It's a big commitment, but it's, it's such a great investment. Gonzalez says it's made a huge difference in her daughter's life. She's really blossomed and has lots and lots of friends now. Lydia says she plans to continue her success at Odyssey and then wants to go on and study to be a surgeon. Colleen May, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. Now there are all types of students enrolled from teen parents to teens who work to ones who suffer health problems. The public school is open to everyone. If you'd like more information about the Odyssey Charter School, log on to our website where you'll find links. The owner of Nevada Power says the company is running out of money. Find out what that means to your bills. Plus, consumer editor Michael Geeser shows us a remarkable new way Dangerous waste is being made harmless. That's in tonight's Channel 8 on your side. Later in this hour, teen pregnancy is a huge issue in Nevada. Tonight, find out which areas of Las Vegas are having the most trouble. But first, Kevin Jennison is here with your first look at neighborhood weather, Kevin. Polly, a few drops of rain fell in parts of the valley today. Just a few and not many parts, but we'll let you know if any more rain is in the forecast. We'll also take a look at the seven-day issue, which brings in an eclipse into our situation as well. We'll give you details on that. As I ramble on, neighborhood weather is coming up, too. Eyewitness News will be right back. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6 with Paula Francis, Gary Waddell, Neighborhood Weather with Kevin Jennison, and Sports with Dave McCann. Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the news leader. He was once one of Nevada's most powerful politicians. Floyd Lamb died yesterday at his home in Lincoln County. He was 84 years old. Lamb worked for 26 years in the state Senate. He was convicted in the early 80s in an influence pedal, for influencing a peddling case. Nevada Power and its parent company, Sierra Pacific, are warning the utility could run out of cash within the month. That's why Nevada Power is asking state regulators for permission to issue nearly a half billion dollars of new debt. 
Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live with Eric Levine on what this means for the power supply in our state. Eric? Well, there's a hearing going on right now. It should be wrapping up just around 6 o'clock. They'll meet again tomorrow for this bond issue, and a decision will come on Friday. Sierra Pacific Resources, the parent company of Nevada Power, is saying that they desperately need to issue bonds to raise another $450 million for the company. The company says it's two recent rate cases that it lost in March and April, along with the sky-high power contracts it signed last year, is causing a cash crunch, so it wants to raise more money, but it's still up to the people. You see to decide if the money is truly needed. We don't look at this application in a vacuum, but it's conceivable that uh, the commission could feel that some or all of this is not appropriate, and we'll find we'll find that out on Friday after we hear the evidence. And the state consumer advocates office also attended this hearing. Their position is that the money is not needed. They believe Nevada Power can get through the summer by renegotiating contracts with suppliers and using existing cash. And their fear is that if the company issues bonds at a high interest rate, it will come back to haunt rate payers with a higher rate hike. Meanwhile, the stock of Sierra Pacific has dropped more than 50 percent in the past couple months. And of course, customers here in Nevada are watching very closely. They want to make sure if we have a very hot summer, the company has enough money to buy extra power. Eric Levine, Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live. Thanks, Eric. Hospitals produce lots of potentially dangerous garbage every week. And tonight's Channel 8 on your side, the new way all that waste is being handled. Plus, in tonight's Channel 8 Medical Breakthroughs, a new nighttime treatment for kidney patients. We'll show you how it works. Later in this hour, find out which areas of the valley are struggling the most with teen pregnancy problems. For the next seven years, federal mandates call for medical facilities to reduce the amount of waste they send to landfills or incinerators. But they're not being asked to reduce the amount by just a little. They're being asked to do it by 50 percent. Channel 8 on your side, consumer editor Michael Geiser is here to tell us how two local medical facilities plan to tackle this huge problem. Both the Flamingo Surgery Center and the Institute of Orthopedic Surgery are trying out this new technology in Las Vegas. Technology that will keep medical waste out of the landfill and operating room technicians injury free. When a patient leaves the hospital, their medical waste stays behind. In many cases, it's poured into a plastic container like this one. But as operating room technicians around the valley have found over the years, that container has been a source of injury and contamination. Not to mention the hassle of having to dispose of the waste. To remove waste in the past, operating room technicians would have to wear gloves, goggles, and an apron, and then lift a bucket off the floor. Then they'd have to carry the bucket, which can weigh up to 40 pounds. You'd then have to carry this into a hopper and unscrew a top, and then pour the liquid right into the sink. But thanks to a new device, not anymore. Now, the Neptune has burst on the scene, a closed system that eliminates the use of canisters and doesn't have to be carried. Instead, it quietly rolls to a docking station, preventing the one thing operating room workers fear, sudden splashing. Once this is uh, contained, it is wheeled out of the room and put into a docking station, which has a 500-pound magnet, um, which then uh, rinses and uh, delivers and dumps the waste all without any risk to the worker. It takes away a lot of concern because it's, like I said, it's all self-contained. You, you never touch the fluid. You don't, you, you, you're never going to be exposed to it at all. That's a big deal to hospitals and surgery centers where before money was being spent to continually test workers and pay compensation after accidents. Anytime that you have an exposure, um, that person, you know, um, by any kind of rules needs to be uh, tested. And those tests can run anywhere from $1,000 to uh, $1,500 in testing. And then, you know, heaven forbid that that person um, be contaminated, you know, those costs can rise as well. When you actually um, calculate how much you're actually spending for um, the rest of the waste management systems that we were using in the past, and how we're using this system is a cost savings for us also. And a space-saving move at local landfills, which helps everyone, no matter if you've spent time in an operating room or you worked in one. 
The makers of the Neptune say they will soon develop a treatment for the waste before it actually goes down the drain so that the steps at the other end of the water treatment process are made even easier. Huh. Yeah. It's a neat system. It really is a neat system. Does it, are the patients protected during surgery? When the, the patients are protected. They have this infection control component on the Neptune so that the patient that this device is being used on in conjunction with their surgery never gets contaminated from the previous waste from the previous patient. So yeah. they have all of their corners covered. Now they're just trying to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Sure. For decades, dialysis has been a life-saving treatment for patients with kidney failure. But like other life-saving treatments, there is room for improvement. Dialysis has a 22% mortality rate and a number of other side effects. Now for the first time, there may be a way to improve the quality of life for hemodialysis patients. Paula Francis has more in tonight's Medical Breakthroughs. Three and a half hours a day, three days a week. 220,000 people in the United States go through dialysis. Uh, basically, it's 20 hours a week by the time you get to the center, they get you on the machine, they get you off the machine, you get home. For 48 hours or more, toxins build up in the body and in just three hours are sucked out. Patients are left exhausted and many have high blood pressure. It's screaming for something to be better. Dr. Brent Miller may have something better. It's called nocturnal dialysis. Each night, as they sleep, patients dialysize for six to eight hours. So you're not having a chance to get to that bad place and then rip it all off and then um, feel weak and listless and then start all over again. Now on dialysis for the third time, Krista Havlin dreaded traditional treatment. It was a joke. It was just tiring. It was not a way to live. But with the new treatment? It's 100% better than being in center. Despite concerns with the protocol, Dr. Miller says three benefits are indisputable. You do it during night, you have the whole day free. These patients can eat and drink anything they want. You go from 80 to 90 percent of patients having hypertension and having to take medications to, to 10 percent. For Krista, it meant a sweeter quality of life overall. Paula Francis, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. Right now, only 5% have been trained to use the equipment at home, but Dr. Miller is working on starting a multi-center trial with many more people. For more information about this treatment, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope, write nocturnal dialysis on the front. You can also find information on our website. Well, doctors have identified a protein that exists normally in the cells of the brain as being a possible factor in the development of Parkinson's disease. The study found when the protein mixed with a chemical from a nerve cell, it triggered production of a toxic molecule that killed nerves. Doctors hope the new finding can lead to a treatment for Parkinson's. And that's tonight's Channel 8 Medical Breakthrough, John. Thanks, Polly. We've got a weather breakthrough. It's called a rain cloud, right? Yeah, well, you know, we've only had a tenth of an inch of rain this year. And in the last 12 months, we've only had three quarters of an inch of rain. So if we see one dark cloud, we start <laughs> salivating. Yeah, we had a little bit of weather excitement out there today. As a couple of showers did develop on the west side of the valley and then just to the east of town as well. Here's the way it looked from our camera mounted on top of Boulder Station. And this is the true definition of a brief shower. Let me put this in motion for you. And there's the shower, and then we move the camera a little farther south so we could get the angle. You can see it there on the right, because silly us, we thought the shower would go through, and there it goes, and it's gone. And then it cleared up. We do have a few more clouds on the horizon, but that was it as far as an in-town shower goes. Just enough to wet the ground on the far southwest side of town, and that's it. Let's begin with real-time neighborhood weather. We'll head out to Overton at Lyon Middle School. They had a little measurable rain. It's 86 degrees right now and 18% relative humidity. Out of the lake, they had better than a quarter of an inch of rain as the shower moved through there. 89 degrees is their current temperature. It's 86 near Windmill in Paradise. A little breeze blowing as well. And notice these humidity numbers are up a little bit. And near Alexander and Wallapai in the northwest part of town, they are at 87 degrees. Other neighborhood temperatures, 90 near Cheyenne and Las Vegas Boulevard, a degree cooler near Sahara and Nellis, and it's 85 near Alta and Anasazi in Summerlin, 60 on the mountain, 88 in Indian Springs. Mesquite also comes in at 88 and still triple digits up in Death Valley. Now, when the showers moved through, there was some wind as well. In fact, gusting over 40 miles per hour near Charleston and Torrey Pines and also near Jones and Tropicana outside the valley. The strongest gust was in Prim. That one to 48, but the lake had a gust to 46 miles per hour. 
Highs today as warm as 100 near Flamingo and Boulder Highway, several 99s, and then as you go westward across town, most of the highs were in the low to mid 90s. It was 68 up on Mount Charleston, 105 in Overton, Death Valley, and Laughlin topped out at 109. At McCarran, the top temperature 91, half a dozen below normal. Air quality in the moderate category, mainly due to ozone today. Around the country, it's this area that under the gun, eastern Colorado and western Kansas with some strong thunderstorms, even a couple of tornadoes reported. As far as we're concerned, those showers came down over the mounds, moved into the valley, and poof, gone. That was about it. In fact, the wider view shows the shower over the lake that produced a quarter of an inch of rain, but it raced rapidly south. And that's pretty much the story on what we're dealing with. The system itself was a little area of low pressure that just developed. It moved through and moved through very quickly and will be out of our way as far as tomorrow is concerned. Then strong high pressure builds in. The rest of the action goes to the north, and we don't see anything else developing in the southwest, at least not in the near future, that could give us another chance for rain. Skies will continue to clear once the sun goes down. Look for a low temperature of 70 degrees. Tomorrow, plenty of sunshine, up to 95. Not quite as humid with that northeasterly breeze tomorrow, uh, so you will notice it being a little bit drier. And your seven-day forecast heats up as we get toward the end of the week. In fact, high temperatures reaching 105 Thursday and close to that on Friday. We back off a little bit with some breezes late in the weekend. Next Monday, by the way, one week from today, a solar eclipse will be visible from Las Vegas late in the day as the sun is going down. 70% of the sun will be eclipsed by the moon. We'll talk more about that as the week goes yeah, on. Yeah, we can look at it, right? Well, with protective gear. Right, exactly. Yeah, you want to make sure you have strong protective gear, otherwise the eyes could be in trouble. John. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Kids having kids is a major problem in the Silver State. Tonight, we'll show you the areas of Las Vegas struggling the most with teen pregnancy. And the latest on information that could have prevented the September 11th attacks. I'm Dave McKent. What a day it was for local tennis star Andre Agassi. I'll show you what happened at the French Open in Memphis. Crews are putting together the battlefield where Tyson and Lewis will get it on on Saturday. And we'll take another look at one of the most unsettling boxing wounds I've ever seen. Sports is next here on Channel 8. Channel 8, Eyewitness News with Michael Geezer at Channel 8 on your side. Consumer reports that keep you up to date with the best new products. What to watch out for and how to keep from getting ripped off. Commitment, trust, experience. Channel 8, Eyewitness News, the news leader. Andre Agassi had one of those days in Paris. You know the kind. You start a match at the French Open as a big favorite, only to see yourself getting blown out in the early going. Who hasn't had that happen? Agassi taking on Frenchman Paul-Henri Matou, and the youngster dominates the first two sets, 6-4 and 6-3. Agassi fell down two games to none in the third set before he kicks it into high gear. Andre wins the third, 6-3. Confidence starts to fade for the Frenchman as Agassi wins the fourth set. 6-3, starting to overpower him, and this is for the match for Andre in the fifth set, and quite a way to finish. Both men waging a spectacular battle, but Agassi proves to be too much, and he finishes the incredible comeback, winning the set, 6-3, and advancing into the quarterfinals. Amazing performance there. Mike Tyson says he's ready, and he's going to kill Lennox Lewis Saturday night. Both fighters are in Memphis making their final preparations. They won't see each other face to face until they step into the ring on Saturday. We're told they're not even going to touch gloves before the first bell sounds. Crews at the pyramid began constructing the battlefield or the ring this afternoon. There's still that chance, of course, that something crazy could happen and keep the fight from going off, but all is well so far. Lewis's trainer, Emmanuel Stewart, was talking today. He's bracing for a war. We are training for a Mike Tyson that's going to come charging, totally enraged, like a wild man, as soon as the bell rings. And Lennox is going to not only have to be able to hold him off, but to hurt Mike Tyson. So I think the first two or three rounds are going to be some very vicious wild rounds. Lennox Lewis considers Mike Tyson the most dangerous opponent he's ever fought. And as a result, you're going to see a much dangerous Lennox Lewis, much like he was when he fought the Michael Grants and the Galatas and the Razor Ruddicks, who he also considered to be dangerous. Channel 8 has fight week covered for you. Tomorrow, Mike Tyson scheduled to meet the media for his final press conference. Who knows what's going to happen there? Lennox Lewis talks on Wednesday. The two fighters weigh in during separate weigh-ins on Thursday. Friday night, we'll show you who the money is on locally. We'll have Lim Banker's prediction. And then Saturday night on Eyewitness News at 11, we'll have fight highlights, reaction from Memphis, and local reaction from fight fans watching it 
here in Las Vegas. Should be quite a week. Well, my head's still a little sore after watching what happened Saturday at Atlantic City. Evander Holyfield, is he a dirty fighter? Hasim Rachman and Mike Tyson say he is because he headbutts his way to victory. And look what his headbutting did to Rachman. Maybe Nevada should ban Holyfield from fighting here. Is that not the most bizarre boxing wound you have ever seen? The fight was stopped in the eighth when Rachman couldn't see, and Holyfield was awarded a technical split decision. It's a wonder Rachman didn't bite his ear. You yeah. know what, in that, Ouch. in that fight, uh, though, in that butt, um, Rachman was the one that was doing the head movement, and Holyfield was just straight Yeah, well, I saw the it. highlights, too, and Holyfield has a history of doing that. He oh. rammed him with his he head all close. night long. He fights Can you believe it looks like a tumor oh, or something? It's goodness. like another head yeah. out there. It finally went down, though. should give goodness. Holyfield two wins for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. All right. See what happens again and fire it up. There is more news straight ahead on Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live at 6.30. A new way to look at the problem of teen pregnancy. Find out which areas of town are having the most trouble with pregnant teens. Find out why many experts say a failure to share information allowed the terrorists to carry out their plan on September 11th. And later see why these men are lining up in hopes of being painted blue. Kate Maddox has your eye on entertainment. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6.30 with Paula Francis, Gary Waddell, Neighborhood Weather with Kevin Jennison, and Sports with Dave McCann. Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the news leader. Thanks for staying with us. Teen pregnancy rates overall are on the decline here in Clark County. But a year-long study suggests that in some specific areas, the rates are skyrocketing. Channel 8 Eyewitness News reporter Andrea Bond has more on that study that was released today. Antoinette Prieto's life has dramatically changed in the past few years, starting with the birth of four-year-old Ricky and most recently, two-month-old Anthony. I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's a big responsibility. There are many more teens in Clark County like Antoinette. A new study by the Clark County Teen Pregnancy Prevention Coalition found that on average there are just under 32 pregnancies for every 1,000 teen girls in Clark County. But in 13 zip codes comprised of higher risk neighborhoods, the rate significantly increased. And in three of those zip codes, the rate nearly tripled. Now that researchers know where the problem areas are, they're looking to address gaps in services. For instance, if we find that we have a very high teen birth rate in a particular zip code, and then we go and look in that zip code, and we find out that there are no services for teens, then we've learned something, and we can go from there. Adding more services will come too late for young moms like Antoinette Prieto, but she hopes they will help other teens like her. Andrea Bond, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. Study found that teen pregnancy rates are growing fastest among the Asian and Hispanic populations. Rates for the Caucasian and African American populations are on the decline. Another part of that survey focused on other at-risk behaviors in Valley teenagers. The study showed 17% of Valley teenagers smoke regularly, 32% drink alcohol frequently, and 17% say they use marijuana frequently. U.S. soldiers killed one armed man as they worked to seal off several caves in eastern Afghanistan. About 100 soldiers flew into the Jalalabad area near the Pakistan border this weekend. The troops blew up several caves believed to have been used by Al Qaeda members. The soldiers destroyed the caves so Al Qaeda and Taliban members couldn't hide there and then crossed the border into Pakistan. Well, there is another controversy brewing about information the intelligence community had before September 11th. The CIA